Dance Hall of Science is the Science Education Center on the Berkeley campus of the University of California. Since 1968, the Lawrence Hall has served the public, teachers, and schools with innovative programs designed to foster greater understanding of science, mathematics, and computer technology. It has done this in three ways. As a discovery museum, the Lawrence Hall enables visitors to explore science through exhibits and laboratory activities. As a research and curriculum development center, it has gained an international reputation. The programs of the Lawrence Hall of Science have been translated into more than 18 languages for use in schools around the world. And across the nation, teachers consider the Lawrence Hall a valuable resource for training and updating their knowledge of science, mathematics, and instructional uses of computers in the classroom. The Center for Multisensory Learning at the Lawrence Hall of Science serves the science education needs of disabled students. Its programs reflect a philosophy of student inquiry and problem solving. Through a multisensory hands-on approach to learning, the center's programs make science more accessible to all students, regardless of their disabilities. Activities from two of these programs, Science Activities for the Visually Impaired and Science Enrichment for Learners with Physical Handicaps, are featured in this video refresher course. Although the Savvy and Self programs were developed for disabled students at the elementary and junior high school levels, now these programs find numerous applications in a much broader cross-section of American education. These carefully crafted programs enable all students to work with their teachers and enjoy the satisfaction of discovering science firsthand. Welcome to the Center for Multisensory Learning. I'm Linda DeLuke, and this is my colleague Larry Malone, and we're here to overview one of the nine Savvy Self modules, this one entitled Scientific Reasoning. This module, like the others, was originally designed to be used with small groups of disabled youngsters, but it's been used beautifully with larger groups of youngsters in the mainstream. In fact, this particular module has been used very successfully with entire classes of students in grades three through eight. Unlike some of the other modules, this one does not have, the activities do not have to be done in any special sequence. All of the activities focus on one theme, that of variables. We define a variable as something that can be changed and that might make an effect in the outcome of an experiment. Each activity uses different materials to develop this concept. Consider the activities on the perimeter of a wheel, each with its own spoke leading into the central theme of variables and controlled experimentation. In Jump It, the youngsters investigate variables that might affect the distances they can jump and use metric units to record distances. In Howdy Heart, they investigate the effects of exercise, a variable, on the rate at which their hearts beat. They use stethoscopes for listening to heartbeats. In Swingers, youngsters experiment with variables that do and do not affect the behavior of pendulums. The students graph the results and use their graph to predict the behavior of additional pendulums. In plain sense, they manipulate three variables to test their effect on the outcome of airplane flights along a line. And finally, in rafts, youngsters determine the largest number of washers that each of three rafts of different thicknesses can support before sinking. The teacher instructions are written up in activity folios. Here's a packet of activity folios. Starts with the overview folio, and there's one title for each of the activities. And included is the record sheet for one of the activities. The students use the equipment, and here's one of the boxes. This one is for scientific reasoning, and this box contains enough equipment for students four to 16 students to use at one time. Let's go over the activities now, and let's start with the activities swingers. For that, we'll need some equipment, and this is the equipment that we'll use. Each student or team will get a string, a large paper clip, and a washer. And I'll have Larry do this as I do it. I'll take the string, it has a loop, one loop on each end, I'm going to put the large paper clip on one of the loops. 
and then take the washer and put it over the paper clip like a hook. We then ask the students what we can do with this system, the system made up of a string, a paper clip, and a washer. And they usually tell us that the system can swing. And that's what we want to do with it. This sy system is also called a pendulum, and we introduce that vocabulary. But we also use the descriptive language of a swinger. We want to find out how many times our swinger will swing in 15 seconds. To conduct the experiment, we're going to standardize it. We're going to use a pencil. We're going to tape the pencil onto the edge of the table and hang our swinger from the pencil. I'll have Larry do this, and we'll go through one experiment. Pencil in place. Okay. We hang the swinger on there, and the students give a couple of practice swings. And then the teacher waits for some questions to come from the students. The two questions that we'd like them to ask are, where do we release the pendulum? And what is a cycle? In answer to the first, where do we release it, we pull the string so it's straight out or even with the edge of the table. And that's where we'll release. In answer to the second question, what's a cycle, we are going to count complete cycles. So the swinger will go away from us and then come back, and that we'll call one swing. OK, I'm going to time it for 15 seconds, and Larry will count for us, and we'll see what we get. OK, ready, set, swing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Stop. Twelve swings. Okay, we got twelve swings in fifteen seconds. I'll just describe the other experiments that we do, and then we'll record our results. We then ask the students, what can we do that might change the number of swings we get in fifteen seconds? And they can offer a number of things. Three of the things they usually come up with are. We can change the release position. Instead of starting down, uh, starting straight out, we can start down at a 45 degree angle. They also suggest that we can put more weight on the swinger. Instead of one washer, we can add two washers. And the final thing that they suggest is that we can change the length of the swinger. Instead of the length we have, we can make it shorter or we can make it longer. We then test those variables. The first one we start off with is release position. We set it up. We count for 15 seconds, and the students find that that variable does not make any difference. We then add another washer, do the same experiment, and they also find out that that one does not make any difference. Now, we've identified all these things as variables. Again, something that you can change that might affect the outcome of an experiment. It doesn't necessarily have to affect it. And these first two variables that we tried the release position and the weight do not make any difference. We then ask the students to remove one of the washers and to record on the number line that's posted on the board, and Larry will go up and do that for us, place their swinger on the hook next to the number that represents the number of swings they had in 15 seconds. And all the students will see the swingers hanging up there on number 12 or number 13, depending upon the length of the swinger. We then distribute random lengths of string, some very long, and some quite short, and some intermediate. We go through the experiment again, time for 15 seconds. The students count, and then they record. And Larry's already recorded a few. He's going to record a few more so that we can see the pattern that emerges. Now you ask the students if they can describe the pattern that they see up on the board. And this is not an easy thing to do. Uh, youngest students who can do this will probably be in third grade. It gets a little bit easier as they get older. But what they'll say is that the shorter the string, the greater the number of times it swings in a unit of time. And conversely, the longer the string, the shorter or the fewer the number of times it swings in 15 seconds. Now we can elaborate upon that by drawing a line with chalk through 
through the washers and you can see that it's not a straight line but rather it's a curved line and that's really all that we want the students to see that it's not a straight line as they might suspect but a curved line now do you happen to see any of the swingers up there that don't fit that pattern and that's the question we'd ask the students and I see one on 22 that doesn't seem to fit that pattern so we'd recheck that one as a class I'd time, all the students would count, and we'd find that indeed it was out of place and it belongs there on uh, 17. That looks pretty good. Okay, and you may have to do that with a number of them until the pattern actually falls out. Now what we have up there is a concrete graph. The actual results of our experiment are hanging up there on the number line and are used to display the pattern. That's the first level of abstraction in recording our results. We can now go on to levels two and three. The second level of abstraction is the pictorial level, and here's an example of that. The students have to measure the length of their swingers, and then they draw in the string and the washers so that they have a representation or a picture of the concrete graph. It looks like the actual results. That's the second level. Now we can go on to the third level, which is the symbolic level. Here's an example of that, a two-coordinate graph. Everything is resolved into symbols. We can't see the swingers any longer. There are no um, strings or washers in there. But everything has been resolved to data points or symbols. We still get the same curved relationship. So you can see that in savvy self-activities, we weave math right into the science, and it falls out very nicely. Now, if you're working with large classes of students, there's an easier way to get the swingers made. Instead of you making them, you have your students make the swingers. And let me show you how that can be done. We need a string, a small paper clip, a penny, and now I need a measuring tool, and I'm going to use the Savvy Self meter tape. See, the first swingers that we use need to all be exactly the same length, and the teacher needs to tie those up ahead of time to do the activity as we previously did it. But this way, the students can do the work instead of the teacher. I'm going to tie this small paper clip onto this string. Any old knot will do, just need to get it on securely. That's the first step. The second step is that I need to measure a swinger that's exactly 38 centimeters long. And to do that, I put the tip of the paper clip on one end of the meter tape, and I draw it out to 38 centimeters. I then fold the swinger over and take a small piece of tape, and I tape it around that loop. So I still have a loop where I can hang my pencil. I then need a weight, and for the weight, I'm going to use a penny. It's cheaper than a washer. And now I have a swinger. And if the students follow those procedures, you'll end up with swingers that are all the same length. And then when it comes to the longer lengths, you merely ask the students to make up swingers according to these numbers, starting with 15 centimeters and going up to 170 centimeters. The students have to cut, measure, tape, and then they do their experiment. And then it all falls out very nicely. That's the end of the swingers activity. We'll now go on to the plain sense activity. For the plain sense activity, I'll need to go back to my equipment box and get some more items. I'll need my airplane, which is the central player in this activity. I'll need some monofilament fishing line, 10 pound test for the flight line. And I'll also need some duct tape to hold the whole business together. This airplane is a very motivating piece of apparatus for the students to use in the classroom. So let's set it up and get started without further ado. I've already fastened one end of a piece of the 10-pound test monofilament fishing line to the back of a chair. Chairs are very convenient locations to, uh, to fasten the flight line. Now, I'm going to thread the airplane on, propeller flying away from me. I'm going to thread the string.
string right through the upper support part of the airplane so now it can hang and slide freely on the flight line. I'm now going to use duct tape, I have a small piece right here, to secure the other end of the flight line to the back of the second chair. Now the students have three challenges to meet. First of all, the first challenge is to get the airplane to fly. Second, to get the airplane to fly the length of the line. And third, to discover how many winds of the propeller it takes to accomplish that task. Now, sometimes the students will try to wind the propeller backwards. The result will be of limited success. Now, once I've got the propeller wound up a certain number of times to uh, test my experiment, I check to see if the flight line is clear, and I release. Sure enough, a success. And I knew ahead of time that it was going to take somewhere between 30 and 40 winds of the propeller to make it fly the length of the string. But it may take the students three or four or five flights in order to make that discovery. After the students successfully fly the length of the string, the next challenge is make your airplane fly halfway along the string. Now, with such a challenge, we're calling on the student's intuitive sense of variables to come up with a solution. The notion that it takes about half as many winds to fly half the length of the string is a good one. And in fact, when the students try it, they'll find that it takes half or actually a few more winds of the propeller to fly the length of the string, because there seems to be an oomph factor to get the airplane started. After the students find the number of winds it takes to fly halfway, we invent or reinforce the notion of a variable. Anything we can change in our experiment that might change the outcome is called a variable. The number of winds of the propeller is a variable that affects the outcome of our experiment. The outcome is the distance of the flight. We then ask the students to think about other variables that might affect the flight of our, of our airplane. And usually they'll come up with a multitude of suggestions. Students might suggest that uh, the size of the, size of the propeller is a variable that might affect the outcome, or perhaps the tension of the flight line, the length of the flight line, the material that the flight line is made from, perhaps the size of the rubber band, or the number of rubber bands. These are all variables that affect the flight line. Excuse me, the behavior of the airplane. The slope of the line is another one, or perhaps the weight. And the same large paper clips that we used in the first experiment with the swingers can be added to the airplane system in order to increase the weight and therefore to see how the variable of weight affects the outcome. Now, the Savvy Self program provides these airplanes in the equipment box. And all you need to do is take them out, set them up, and fly them. But for regular education, we've found that there's value in having the students build their own airplanes previous to doing the experimentation. I'd like to real quickly go through the procedure for making your own airplanes in your classroom. Students generally work in teams, and a team of four seems to be an appropriate size. Each team will need the following materials and tools. Popsicle sticks form the body of the airplane. At one end goes a propeller. At the other end goes a hook, which, is, which secures the other end of the rubber band. And here's the rubber band. Paper clips are used later when weight is required. The other two essential ingredients in our airplane construction are soda straws. And I have a red one and a white one. But more than that, I have a jumbo and a super jumbo. And I can always tell one from the other because the jumbo will slide right through the super jumbo straw, and that will become important in a moment, as you'll see. Now, if I try to form the two paper clips, excuse me, the two popsicle sticks into the body of the airplane, I can't get the hook or the propeller on. So the first thing I need to do is work with sandpaper to shave off one edge of each stick just a little bit. That should do it. Other end, just that much. Second stick, same deal.
Now when I take the two sticks, hold them together, I can insert them into the hook. And same thing, propeller on the other end. I'm making progress now. Now I need the uprights, which will support the cross piece where the string will be sliding. I take my super jumbo straw and cut it approximately in half. Then using a one hole punch, I'm going to punch a hole near the end of each half of the super jumbo. About like that. Same thing, other half. And now I'm going to take the jumbo straw and thread it through the two holes that I've just punched. Next step is to flatten down the upright pieces, the super jumbo segments, just a little bit so that I can catch them between the two popsicle sticks. Now I'm going to space them approximately one popsicle stick length apart. I'm going to catch the ends of the two super jumbo segments between the two popsicle sticks. And you can see the structure now starting to emerge. Now I've been careful that the slope that I sanded is up toward this cross piece. That's important. Now what I'm going to do is take a common desktop stapler, and I'm going to staple right through the sticks and the piece of soda straw hair, like that. And I'm going to repeat the same process on this side. Things are looking pretty good now. I need to cut these little tips of straw that extend below the bottom of the popsicle sticks. And now all that remains is to trim my jumbo straw to an appropriate length, attach the propeller and the hook, and last, fix the rubber band in position and I'm all ready to go. Now one thing that you have to be careful of is that the length of the upright supporting the cross piece straw is long enough that the propeller won't hit the cross piece up here. If it's too short, you'll be completely out of business. That's essentially how to build your airplane. And it's a joy to watch students uh, working in teams in friendly competition with one another, trying to see who can be the first done with their airplane, who can get the best airplane, the fastest airplane, the most creative design preparatory to uh, doing the plane sense activity to investigate variable perhaps the next day. We'd like to move now to the third activity in the scientific reasoning module called rafts, where we'll be bringing out water and floating rafts to see how many passengers they can support. As Larry explained in this activity, we're going to use water. And we never do this activity as the students first experience in scientific reasoning, but rather later on in the module. Students equate water with play, and they often don't take it as seriously if it's their first experience. But I think we're ready now to delve into this basin of water with these wooden rafts. And this is what we use in the activity. We have three rafts. We don't introduce all three of them at first, but rather only two. And these are the two rafts. And we ask the students to compare them and to tell us how they're the same and how they're different. And they see they're made out of the same wood, they're the same shape, but they differ in one way in their thickness. One raft is thin, the other is thick. Let's see if we can float these rafts, see how they behave in water. So we'll float them, and they do appear to float rather than sink. The next challenge is to see if we can put some passengers, and we use these washers, the same washers we used in swingers, and let's see how many we can put on. Um, actually, at the first, let's just see which raft holds more washers, the thin raft or the thick raft. So let's put some on, see
see which holds more. Whoops. I have five on there that already started to tip. It appears that the thick one holds more. Okay. You get the idea. Now this is just qualitative. Now we're going to make it quantitative. We're going to actually count how many washers each raft will hold. And to do that, we're going to introduce another piece of equipment, the raft fence, which we can just clip on there. And now this will help us in positioning the washers, and it will also prevent them from sliding off. So let's set our rafts in there and see how many each raft will hold. Seven. You hold me up. That was sixteen. Okay. Now we're going to record using this concrete recording device. I'm going to take four, five, six, seven washers. Actually, the students can take the actual washers right out of the base and put them in there. Okay, now we're all set to introduce the third raft. And we introduce it to the students, ask them to compare this raft to the other two, and they can see that it's intermediate in thickness. At this point, we ask them to predict, not to guess as they might have done for the thick raft and the thin raft, but rather to predict how many washers it will take to sink this intermediate raft. A prediction is different than a guess in that it's based in context. The students have some information to base their guess or prediction on. It's the same as in swingers. We ask the students to predict how many times a swinger will swing after they've had experience with a number of different lengths. Same thing here. We're asking them to predict. And they, if they can look at their results, they will probably predict an intermediate value. The very last thing the students do is to make a raft sandwich. They take some rubber bands, put all three rafts and a fence together, and predict how many washers it will then take to sink the raft sandwich. Now, this activity is a beautiful one to do with small groups of students, but in a large classroom, it may get a little expensive using this equipment, so we have an alternative. And this is the alternative, to make styrofoam boats. And in fact, the students can make their own using a standard styrofoam cup. They can measure and cut a boat so that it's 5 centimeters tall, 3.7 centimeters tall, and 2.2 centimeters tall, and use pennies in order to sink their boats. The activity is done in the same fashion. They use the, the small one and the tall one, and then they predict for the intermediate boat. The next activity we're going to look at is called Jump It. I've set up a jumping station right here in advance, and this is the kind of thing that you'd want to set up in your classroom. You might set up one if you want to maintain control over the situation, or as many as three or four stations if your students are able to act more independently. Here's a Savvy Self meter tape, and I've taped one right here to the floor and then a more standard type of plastic meter tape is taped beyond that because there's an off chance that I'll be able to jump more than a meter here. Also, I've established a starting line right here where I've taped down a piece of sandpaper. Uh, this is important for students who will be finding the starting line with their tactily. Otherwise, you could just put down a piece of tape for students who will be starting with a visual starting line. I'm all set now. What I'm going to do is tow the line prepare myself, and make a standing long jump. After I'd done so, a partner would come up, mark the location of my toes, and uh, that would be a, a record of how far I was able to jump. But now the question is, can I do anything that might change the distance I can jump? The jump will be the experiment. The distance I jump is the outcome. I want to investigate variables. 
that determine the distance I can jump. Things that come to mind are jumping on one foot. How will that affect the distance I can jump? Perhaps jumping sideways or jumping backwards. Perhaps I take on a load of books or other paraphernalia to jump with. That's a variable, carrying extra weight, closing my eyes. You get the idea. Anything you can change in your jumping style that might affect the distance you can jump is a variable. And so we go and systematically investigate a series of variables with jumping. After the students have identified the variables they want to investigate, they can record in a chart, like the one Linda's holding here. Students fill in the variables, do the experimentation, and record the results on their chart. It's an easy activity. It's an activity that young students, just being introduced to the ideas of variables, can readily get involved with and have a lot of fun with, at the same time, learn about variables. The last activity we want to share with you is Howdy Heart, and I think Linda's got the equipment for that activity right here. The equipment that we use in the Howdy Heart activity is this piece of equipment, stethoscope, and we introduce it as a tool to make sounds louder. We offer some suggestions for safety and also some guidelines for uh, health. We have the students wash off the earpieces with an alcohol wipe before putting it in their ears. We then invite them to put the stethoscope on, to get up and to explore the sounds in the room to see how the stethoscope makes sounds louder. They then come back to a table about this size and working in a small group. Each of the students puts on their stethoscope. I'll ask Larry to put this one on. And they put the diaphragm of the stethoscope on the tabletop. And then the teacher, with a pencil underneath the table, makes some very quiet taps, single taps, and the students count the number of taps. I'll just tap on the top of the table here. After I'm sure that all the students are hearing and able to count those taps, then I make it a little more difficult. Instead of single taps, I'll use double taps, similar to the lub-dub that a heart might make. And when I'm sure that the students can hear those and can count those, then we're ready to move on to the next part of the activity where the students team up in partners. One student is the listener. The other student actually is the, the, the victim or the experimenter. And Larry's going to count the number of times that my heart beats in 15 seconds. We also need a timer, and that's the role of the teacher. He's now taking my resting heart rate. We then asked the students what we could do that might increase or decrease the number of times heartbeats in 15 seconds. And the students suggest all kinds of things. They usually offer exercise, some form of exercise, to change the number of times their heart beats. We introduce that as a variable. Exercise is a variable in the experiment. The number of times the heart beats is the outcome. The students either run in place or do jumping jacks for about a minute, and then we take the active heart rate for 15 seconds and see if there's any difference. Again, the same number of, of seconds, 15 seconds, and he counts my active heart rate. Then the students record for their own heart rate their resting and their active heart rate by taking sticky dots and sticking it next to the number that represents the number of times their heart beat in that amount of time. We then talk about some other variables that they could perhaps test at home. Some of the ones that they're able to do, they might, they might look at the variable of age or height or weight of a number of different people, either their family members, or they could even use another class and count and record their heart rate and use different variables. That brings us to the end of this module. We hope that these activities bring the joy and excitement of scientific reasoning to you and to your students. And for now, goodbye from the Center for Multisensory Learning. For information about additional video refresher courses in this series, contact the Center for Multisensory Learning, Lawrence Hall of Science, University of California, Berkeley, California, 94720 or call area code 415-642-8941.